lunch coma is coming on strong, and I would not want to eat into too much of your nap time. There is a handout up front if you want to grab that either now or afterwards. It's just the text, um, the texts, plural, I guess I should say, that we're going to be discussing. Um, for those very few of you who like such things, there's also the Greek text on there as well um, that may clarify some of the things that we are discussing. So I do appreciate all of y'all being here and braving um, the afternoon drowsiness. I uh, promise to lull you to sleep uh, with my dulcet tones. But I do appreciate you coming out this afternoon. Um, we'll try to finish up in a timely manner and let you guys go and have your afternoon nap before going to worship this evening. Uh, what I was tasked with, and, and how these sorts of things tend to happen, is that uh, David and Cluster walks into my office and he says, hey, we need someone to do a lecture. You should do this. I say, yes, sir, because that's how I keep my job. Um, <laughs> But this is a, and a very interesting topic, one that I like a lot. I get to teach, I'm blessed to be able to teach the New Testament History and Geography course. I teach generally two sections of that every spring. And as we go through, we get to go through Luke and Acts, and this is the only New Testament class they let me teach. But what I get to see here, because I do so much Old Testament, is I get a really good idea and a really good taste and a good feel for a lot of the Old Testament parallels and echoes that echo through Luke's gospel. That's so what we're doing here, talking about the echoes of Elijah and Elisha and Jesus' ministry, is it is in some ways a difficult topic, because if we were going to go through all four gospels and look at every single allusion and echo and citation of Elijah and Elisha, we would not get our nap, nor would we even make it to worship this evening. So what we've done to kind of edge in these parameters a little bit is that I am going to restrict myself only to looking at Luke's gospel. First and foremost, because I'm not a large, a huge fan of Franken gospel approaches, I think it gives us a better idea of Luke's uh, theological approach. But second, of course, for time. Uh, the second thing we're going to do in order to make this a little bit more manageable in size, is, and to make it a little more approachable, hopefully, is we're going to try to balance enough obvious examples of the ministry of Elijah and Elisha in the Gospel of Luke to make you buy in with enough of the obscure that hopefully you don't say at the end of this time, well, I knew all of that already. So I will say right up front that I rely heavily here on Richard Hayes' excellent volume, Echoes of Scripture in the Gospels. If you have not read it, you should. It's the favorite book I've read in the past three years, and I rely heavily on him and a lot of his work in my lecture this afternoon. So let's get started. Let's look at the first really obvious example. If you go over to Luke chapter 4, this is the beginning of Luke's ministry, or sorry, Jesus' ministry, and Luke has moved forward, um, if you compare it to the other Gospels, he has moved forward, even to Luke, his first sermon to stick it there in Nazareth, and after he quotes the, the very important, very commented upon version of Isaiah 61, he says this beginning there in 25. I tell you the truth. There were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath, in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And when they heard these things, all the synagogue were filled with wrath. They rose up, they drove them out of town, they brought them to the brow of a hill on which their town was built, so they could throw them off the cliff, but passing through their midst, he went away. What we're going to notice is there's two broad categories of Elijah and Elisha echoes in the Gospel of Luke. The first one's the ones we're going to see clustered here at the beginning of the Gospel, and that is to show that Jesus is like Elijah and like Elisha. And here we have it, laid out just as easy as can be. Jesus said, you want me to tell you what I'm like? You want to tell me what my ministry is like? You want me to tell you what you're going to be like? It's like Elijah and Elisha. 
And so he begins right here at the beginning to quote that there were many widows in the days of Elijah and your um, uh, ears should be tuned and you know exactly what he's talking about here. He's referencing the story back in 1 Kings chapter 17 that we know so well. Right, Elijah comes there in verse 1 and announced that there's going to be no rain. Um, first, God sends him out to the brook to be fed by ravens. Eventually, the brook dries up. God says, hey, no, I'm going to get you to go to a widow who can provide for you. And he goes up to Zarephath, the, the land of the queen whom he is having to hide from and dodge and is the source of all the woes of Israel. And he goes up to this widow. It's already been several years, so it's a long time of famine. And he goes up to her and says, hey, show me hospitality. Make me some food. Give me something to drink. And she says, um, Lord, excuse me, uh, let me just, in case you hadn't noticed, there's a famine. And I'm about to, I don't have a whole lot. I'm a widow. When you're a stranger, you're not even one of my hometown. I'm about to cook the last bit of bread we got, drink the last bit of oil, me and my son here, we're going to eat it, and we're going to die. And Elijah more or less says, that sounds great, feed me first. <laughs> and if you feed me first, you won't die, and your flour won't run out, and your oil won't run out. And if I was this widow, I'd think, well, I've heard this one before. <laughs> right? Yeah, the whole feed me now and I'll get, you'll get the rich screen, um, scheme quit pretty soon afterwards. But she does. She does provide for Elijah first out of the very little that she has, out of the impending death that she is looking forward to. And Jesus says, you know, it's going to be just like that. Because... Elijah went to her because there were no faithful widows in Israel. And this looks forward to Israel's rejection of Jesus. Looks forward to the cutting off of this branch and sending it to the Gentiles. And the representation, the recognition that even the home of Jezebel, God found faithfulness missing in the home of Ahab. Uh, but then he goes on because, you know, Jesus wants to make sure that the people get the point. And he says, well, and let's, let's, let's cite another example. If there were many lepers in the time of Elisha, but God didn't heal any of them, now did he? But instead he healed man. And y'all remember this story as well. It's a well-known story. Everybody likes this story. It helps teach about baptism, things of that nature. And so we have there in 2 Kings chapter 3 that Israel and Syria, or Israel and Aram, your version may call it, um, they've been at war for some time. And their leading general, the man whom it says God had given victory over Israel through, this guy named Naaman, he is a leper. And he's captured in one of these raids, a slave girl. And she says, oh, man, I wish you were in Israel because they have Elisha, and Elisha can heal you, and it would just be great. Everything would be wonderful. And the king tells, I mean, the Naaman tells the king, and the king says, well, we can take care of that. We're, you know, a whole lot stronger than Israel anywhere. So he sends down a mixture of an embassy and a bribe and a threat to the king. He eventually ends up over there um, at the house of Elisha. You remember the story? Elisha is like, well, I'm not going to go out and see you. You're not really that important. Let me send out my slave. He'll talk to you. Go dunk yourself in the river seven times, you dirty Aramean. And of course, he's like, you think our rivers aren't better than the Jordan? Anybody who's been to the Jordan River, in particularly during the dry season, will be similarly unimpressed. But eventually, of course, he listens to another of his slaves, and he does. He relents from his pride. He obeys, and he is cleansed of his leprosy. And Jesus' clear point when he quotes this example, he says, listen, why was this the guy that was cleansed of his awful disease? Weren't there plenty of lepers in Israel? Why was an enemy, one who was persecuting the very people of God, why did he get to be cleansed? And the answer is pretty clear. Because Naaman was faithful and obedient. And Naaman was humble enough to seek out the prophet's 
that Naaman was humble enough to listen to his slaves, that Naaman submitted himself to the prophet's direction, that in his salvation we find the rejection of Israel. It's perhaps even possible that God had given him victory in, over Israel so that he could rise to prominence for Syria, so that God could have him in a position to be strong enough and important enough to the king to send him to the prophet. Because that's how God's providence tends to work. And even in the home of Hazael, God found the faithfulness missing in the home of Joram. Unless we think that these kind of conclusions, the idea of rejection and faith and mistreatment are, are a little too tenuous, well, I would suggest that we can see from the reactions of the people who listen to Jesus that they knew exactly what he was saying. Because what do they do? They try to kill him. We'll show you we're not like the people who rejected and tried to kill the prophets. We're going to try to kill you. That'll show you. And Jesus, you can know, imagine thinking, well, it's kind of proven my point, right? But this is a pretty obvious example. It means to show that Jesus' ministry is going to be the same way as Elijah and Elisha. His goals are going to be the same as Elijah and Elisha. The ultimate rejection and faith that he's going to receive are like Elijah and Elisha. But very quickly, Luke is going to pivot. And what Luke is going to do, because Luke likes to do these things, he likes to cluster sections together where each time you go a little farther forward, the picture becomes a little more clear. And so what he's going to do in the next section of his gospel, he's going to say, let me show you actually that Jesus is not like Elijah and Elisha. He is in fact far, far, far greater. And to see that, all we have nowhere uh, further, don't have to look any farther forward than the well-known passage of Jesus' kind of first cleansing, the raising of the widow's son, there in Luke chapter 7, verses 11 and following. It's a short enough text, I think we should read it. So he says, soon afterwards, Jesus went into a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. And as he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who has died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the crowd, I'm sorry, from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. And he said to her, do not weep. And then he came up and he touched the buyer. And the bearer stood still and he said, young man, I tell you, rise. And the dead man rose and began to speak. And Jesus gave him again to his mother. So fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread throughout the whole of Judea and the surrounding country. Now this passage, this little pericope, is exclusively found in Luke. And whenever you're reading through the Gospels and you find something found specifically in that uh, Gospel, or if you find something that is emphasized in that Gospel rather than the other, you know it's important to what they're doing. And what we have here then is an example of what Hayes would say, the weaving of Scripture stories from Elijah and Elisha is a distinctive element of Luke's telling of the story of Jesus. Not significantly parallel in the other Gospels. And this story should immediately remind us of that story we just referenced a few minutes ago. This is the raising of the widow's son. This is the second half of the story that we quoted already in 1 Kings chapter 17. Because you remember what happened. At first, everything's going well for the widow and her son. You've got a jar of flour that doesn't end um, empty. You've got a jug of oil that never runs dry. Everything's great until, of course, the widow's son gets sick and dies. And the mother accuses Elijah. How dare you come here, Elijah, and by your presence make God's attention focus on us where he sees how sinful we really are. This is your fault. And Elijah seems to at least consider that as a possibility because he has compassion, we read. He takes the son up to his room. He places him on the bed. He does, I guess we call it mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, and he prays that God will have compassion on the widow. He lays upon the child three times. He cries out to God, and then we read that the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. And after Elijah raised this son, 
we read that he delivered him again to his mother. Now this phrase is nothing too special if we're reading along in our English versions there um, of the Old Testament because our English versions of the Old Testament invariably are focused on the Hebrew translation, particularly the Masoretic text. And we have to remember that sometimes what Jesus is using, a lot of times what Jesus is using, a lot of times what the apostles are using, is not actually the Hebrew text of the Masoretic text, but it's instead the Greek translation. The old Greek here of 1 Kings chapter 17 has a very distinctive phrase. It says, Kai edokin autan te matre atu. In other words, he presented him again to his mother. The exact same phrase we read in Luke. Word for word. The exact same phrase. And you remember how then the woman responds after the resurrection of her son. She says, now I know you are a man of God. And what do we read there in Luke chapter 7? But now we know a great prophet has arisen. And at first we think, well, I thought you said, Jared, that this was going to be different. That Elijah isn't like Jesus. And that Jesus isn't the same as Elijah. And this requires a little closer reading, a little more thought. Not a lot. I think you probably picked up on all the main points already. But consider it. How does Elijah resurrect his son? He has to lay upon him three times, breathe the spirit, as it were, back into his mouth. He has to pray to God to have compassion and resurrect him. As David had said in his excellent lecture right before this, there were other people who could do some of the things that we read, but they didn't work every time, and it wasn't effortless. How does Jesus resurrect this kid? Touches the buyer and says, get up. Even the greatest miracle workers of the Old Testament, and I think that Dr. Ward and Nathan did a great job mentioning this in his lecture last night. If you look through the Old Testament, it's not like miracles are happening all the time. They're kind of focused around a few central events, a few central characters that they're focused on the person of Moses, and they're focused on the, people, the persons of Elijah and Elisha. And there is no doubt, if you look through the entire Old Testament, you know who does more miracles than anybody else? It's Elijah and Elisha. And even the two greatest miracle workers of the Old Testament, Elijah and Elisha, pale in comparison to the perfect prophet. That whereas Elijah has to appeal to God and pray and beg that the Lord have compassion, when Jesus the Lord has compassion, he merely commands the dead to arise. And again, we might wonder, oh, are you overreading this? Did anybody, you know, happening at the time of Jesus pick up on these echoes? Because you might think some of those are, are pretty light. They're pretty feather touches. Well, I would suggest if you turn over to Luke chapter 9, you're going to see that a lot of times they do pick up on these approaches. So, for example, and we're going to go through these um, a little quicker to let us kind of focus there in on the end. Um, in, in Luke chapter 9, verse 8, when Herod here heard the things that Jesus was doing. Well, what things? Well, maybe things like raising the widow's son. He was perplexed. And we see there in verse 8 that some thought Elijah had appeared again. In other words, everybody knew this, these are the things that Elijah does. Maybe this is Elijah come back. They had not realized that something greater than Elijah was here. Or let's look just a few verses further, uh, further forward. You remember, of course, the well-known story there in, in Luke chapter 9, verses 28 and following, the transfiguration. Remember who shows up with Jesus on the mountain that, that Peter, James, and John witnessed. It is Moses and Elijah. And it seems pretty clear that even Peter doesn't get the fact that Jesus is greater than Elijah because when he sees these three show up, he's like, hey, let's go three tabernacles. It'll be great. In other words, you each get a tabernacle. You, Lord Jesus, are the same as Moses and Elijah. And it takes God appearing and a cloud coming over and God basically yelling, no, listen to my son. And the other two disappearing with Jesus left alone for them to realize that maybe, you know, something greater than Elijah is here. But then we have... Just about the very next episode, 
that we read in nine, uh, chapter 9, verses 51 through 56, that the days drew near for him to be taken up, so he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him and went and entered the village of the Samaritans to make preparation for him. And the people didn't receive him because he had set his face towards Jerusalem, and when the disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? This this is a great story because what you can see going on this section of Luke is what Luke does. He is layering different echoes from different stories over together to form this really complex image. It's almost like when you see a frame of a slide or a frame of a picture flash before your eyes and before you've really latched onto what it is, it's moved on and it's only a little later you figured out what it was because what's going on here in the, the situation in Luke chapter uh, 9 verses 46 through the end of the chapter and even a little bit into chapter 10 is every one of these stories is referencing Sodom and Gomorrah as well. So here, why do, why do the apostles want to call down fire on the village? Well, who calls down fire on people who have mistreated them? But Elisha. Remember upon the captains of the 50s, we have those passages quoted for you there in your handout, that one of the things that Elisha does is calls down fire on other people. And Jesus has to tell them, no, we're not the same as Elijah. We're doing something different. I am something different. You still haven't figured out what we talked about and saw there at the transfiguration. But again, we might say, okay, we've got these two passages in a row, but again, those are pretty light touches. Well, let's look at this last one that Luke stacks up that maybe will make it a little clearer. And that is, of course, what happens in the very next episode, starting there in verse 7. And as they were going along the road, someone says to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, no, you won't. You don't want that. Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. But to another, he says, you, follow me. And the man replied, well, Lord, first let me go bury my father and my mother. And Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And another one says, Lord, I will follow you. But first, let me go home and say farewell to my parents. And Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And we know these passages really, really well, I imagine. <coughs> but do we hear the echo that's in the background? Because there's nothing so clear as a citation. And what you read, learn as you go through Luke in particular in his gospel, is he quotes in citations, in full quotations, the Old Testament less significantly less than any of the other Gospels. But what he does is nearly every single paragraph is drenched in echoes and light touches and allusions. And what we have here, it is impossible, I think, not to hear the story of the calling of Elisha. Because you know that story there in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 19 through 21. And if you have the handout, I've kind of highlighted a few things for you. It says, so Elijah departed from there, and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him, whereas he was the 12th. And Elijah passed by him, and he threw his cloak upon him. And so he left the oxen, he ran after Elijah, he said, let me go home to kiss my father and my mother. Then I will follow you. Well, what did Jesus say when a man wants to follow him after first going home? Jesus says, no way, Jose, right? But what he says here is Elijah comes up and he says, sure, go back. What have I done to you? So he returns home from following him. He takes the yoke of oxen. He sacrifices them. He boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen. He gave it to the people. They ate. And then he arose after Elijah and assisted him. And what we have here then in this situation is these things that Jesus is kind of trampling over, the burial of parents, the honoring of father and mother. These are things that were in inimical to someone following the Jewish law. The burial of parents is 
the greatest really requirement of honoring father and mother. You read about this all throughout Jewish literature of the time, that the most important things you can do is bury someone. That this is why when we're reading in the prophets about the destruction, whether it's of Jerusalem the first time, the second time, or, or any other destruction, that one of the things they mention as being the height of the terror, the height of showing how bad this is going to be, is people are going to be left unburied. And Jesus says, listen, the, the requirements to follow me are far greater than the law. They're far greater than Moses. But also, the requirements to follow me are far greater than that which was required by the prophets and Elijah. That you have to realize that if something greater than Elijah and Elisha is here, then the requirements of what that means for you is greater as well. But even Elisha wouldn't be able to cut it in following me. But you follow me. Well, now hopefully we've kind of gotten the idea that there are all these different passages, all these light touches, all these echoes of Elisha and Elisha. And now that I've kind of maybe got you hopefully buying into this a little bit, we're going to look at something a little more tenuous still. And you're thinking, oh boy, right? More tenuous than that? That was pretty, uh, pretty barely there. Let's turn over and consider then the end of Jesus' life, the situation leading up to his death, burial, and resurrection. And to do this, we're going to turn over there to Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44. And when Jesus drew near and saw Jerusalem, he wept over it saying, would that you, even you, had known of this day the things that make for peace. But now they're hidden from your eyes. For the day will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. For this... This is an echo of what occurs in 2 Kings chapter 8 in verses 11 and 12. And in this situation, we have Elisha mourning over the coming destruction, not of course of Jerusalem, but of Samaria. But we read too, he is weeping. And he, like Jesus there in Matt, uh, sorry, Luke chapter 19, is weeping because he envisions the coming destruction. And this is a pretty uh, distinct episode. It's a relatively rare occasion. We have a lot of laments, of course, over the coming destruction or the, of the, uh, or the past destruction, too, of Jerusalem. But having this episode and the, the specific sort of pivot word there of weeping makes it harder to miss that this is meant to be an echo of what has occurred there in Kings. But that also sets up, I think, the uh, clearer connection. And that clearer connection is one of my favorites. And that occurs here in Luke chapter 23 during the trial of Jesus. Remember the trial of Jesus before Pilate? Now the whole company of them arose and brought before Pilate. And they began to accuse Jesus, saying, We have found this man to be misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and of saying that he himself is a Christ, a king. And you remember Pilate says, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, or say, You got it in one, right? That this whole situation goes on. But what's happening here is something, again, where it can be um, obfuscated a little bit, because, again, our Old Testaments are translated there mostly from the Hebrew and not necessarily from Greek. And what here we have, and maybe if you're reading a King James Version, I think it translates it this way, <laughs> is that they accuse Christ of being the perverter of our nation. The perverter of of our nation. In other words, this is using a form of the Greek word diastrepho. And this is an echo, again, of Elijah. And this is an echo coming from 1 Kings chapter 18. Remember this, this is when Elijah finally, I'm sorry, Ahab finally comes up to Elijah. They run into each other and he says, is it you? And we all know the great line because, man, Ahab has got some fantastic lines in the Bible. Is it you, O troubler of Israel? Right? 
Uh, and, and troubler is a really good translation there of the Hebrew word that is being used. Um, the, the, the issue is that if we hear that, we don't hear the echo. It's not very clear. But if we look at the old Greek translation there, we have the same phrase. That is it you, O perverter of Israel, O perverter of our nation. And the accusers here, those accusing Jesus of being the perverter of the nation, do not pick up on the absolutely delicious irony of this citation. Because, of course, remember how Elijah responds to Ahab? I'm not the one perverting Israel. You're the one perverting Israel. You're the one who perverted along with your fathers because you have forsaken the Lord your God and have followed the Baals. And in the context there of 1 Kings, we know, of course, what he's talking about is that Israel is attempting to gain power, gain political strength, gain sovereignty, gain security, and the way they've done it is by marrying Ahab to Jezebel, who is, of course, importing prophets of Baal, importing prophets there also of Asherah. And so here then, Jesus doesn't even have to respond because those people who should be picking up on this citation on this echo, hear it already. That Jesus could answer the exact same thing. Me, the perverter of our nation, you're the perverter of our nation, because you, just like the people of Ahab's time, are attempting to gain political security and therefore have denied God and have sought Caesar. Give us Barabbas. Right? We have no king but Caesar. Well, that, of course, is right. That they had rejected their king and lord. And they had sought Caesar. And they had sought Barabbas. That their charge returns back on them. That they are like Ahab, accusing a good man of corrupting the nation. All the while doing that exact same thing themselves. And seeking to kill the only person who could make it straight again. And Luke, Luke doesn't explain any of this, Right? Luke doesn't take it, well, wait a second, let me make sure you've all picked up on the story. Because, of course, Luke, like anybody who's gone to a movie with someone who really likes to ask questions in a movie, for me, that's my mom and my sister. Um, and she wants to stop me in the middle. She's like, tell me what's about to happen. I said, just watch the movie. It's gonna, you're going to find out in two minutes. Right? But no, they've got to pause it. They've got to ask questions. Meredith, mom, I love you. Just not watching movies with you sometimes. But Luke doesn't explain any of this. And hearing the echo is not necessary to follow the story. But the reader who picks up on it, who finds that Easter egg, if we want to push the movie analogy a little too far, um, they will appreciate the narrative irony and the final reversal of fortunes that wit foreshadows. Because does Ahab and does Jezebel get to kill Elijah? Of course not. Elijah is taken up into heaven. And that although Jesus may be killed by the power of Caesar, he too will be taken up into heaven. But right before that happens, of course, right near the very end of Luke's gospel is one last one that I want to talk to you about today. And this one is, uh, maybe you'll think a little bit of a stretch, but I think that maybe, hopefully, we've laid the groundwork to show how Luke does this sort of thing. And when you have all of these different citations clumped right there at the end, then maybe you'll see, and then hopefully it'll be compelling. And if it's not, that's fine, too. But this is what we find in Luke chapter 24. Um, this is on the road to Emmaus. Remember the story. Jesus shows up in the middle of these two guys who are walking around. And Jesus says, hey, what are you, what are you guys talking about? And they're like, what do you mean, what are we talking about? You haven't heard that the man we hoped was, was a prophet who we hoped would redeem Israel. That he was crucified. And Jesus says, you don't say. Tell, tell me more about that. I'm like, how do you not know what happened? Jesus is like, no, 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 explain it to me, right? <laughs> That's a funny story. <laughs> you know, imagine trying to explain to Jesus, well, you see, what happened was. <laughs> oh, really? 
that Jesus is telling them, and he says that, don't you know that the prophets have shown that these things must happen? And of course, they urge him to stay with them after he reveals. He says, um, do you want to eat with us, right? And they're eating with a table, and we read that after they're eating in verse 31 through 2, we read, their eyes were opened. Now, as Rusty had mentioned in his really excellent talk this morning, eyes being opened is not exactly a rare occurrence in the Bible. We read this phrase all the time. But it was, of course, the second part of this phrase. Not only were their eyes open, they said, didn't our hearts burn within us? Now, I'm going to have you focus there on eyes being opened, and burning. Because, of course, you remember this very story that occurs in Elisha's narratives right after Naaman. You know, the one that's probably almost as famous. Because in 2 Kings chapter 6, remember the situation? We've got a king of Syria who is just sick and tired of every time they try to lay a trap that the Israelites get out of it. And he's like, one of you guys is a traitor. And they're like, no, we're not. There's this guy. He's got a prophet in Israel. And, you know, it doesn't even matter whether we hide or whether we talk. He knows what you say in your bedroom. And so, of course, this guy who can find out every military expedition the king does, he's like, well, we're going to send a military expedition to go capture him. Okay. But you remember what happens. They surround Elisha's house. And a servant rises early in the morning and he cries out to his master, afraid of earthly forces. Chapter 6, one, uh, verse 15. What are all the disciples doing at this point? Remember, they're hiding in an upper room locked away because they're worried about earthly forces. What are these people leaving? They're going away. How? We thought this man was going to be redeemed. Israel, we thought he was a prophet, but... Killed by earthly forces. And Elisha says in verse 17, Don't fear. Those who are with us are more than those with them. And he prays and he said, Lord, please open his eyes so he can see. And when his eyes are opened, remember that phrase, eyes are open. What do they see? They see chariots and riders of fire. The type which might burn within them. There are many other echoes of Elijah and Elisha's gom uh, narratives present in the Gospel of Luke. I tried only to focus on, again, a good balance of the obvious and the obscure, but we might lead then to ask, what then is the point? I mean, I mean, if this is just kind of cool, which hopefully you think it is. But it's not just cool. And I think it does a few things. First and foremost, I think it shows what Luke is really trying to do is that you must understand that the mission of Elijah and Elisha is exactly the same as the mission of Jesus. And that should be obvious because who was the God of Elijah and Elisha? God's mission's always been the same. That we hoped you would be the one to redeem Israel. Well, yeah. And that's what he's going to do. But just as the mission to redeem Israel and Elisha, Elisha ended up expanding and including the widow and the leper, so we're going to read that every single time it feels like that we're reading in the Gospel of Luke or in the book of Acts, the people, Jesus says, hey, you're going to be in my kingdom. Hey, you follow me. Hey, you come with me. They're the people that no one thought were going to be part of the kingdom. Tax collectors? Women? Gentiles? But if you read the story of Elijah and Elisha, you should have known that was coming because it was always the point. Secondly, I think it shows that the demands of Christ are going to be far more than the demands of the people in the Old Testament. And this tends to be exactly the opposite of the way we tend to preach and talk about these things. Oh, those in the old law, they had to follow all these little commandments and dill and cumin and all this other stuff. And Jesus says, that stuff's easy. You 
not just love your neighbor as yourself, you love him as I have loved you. And take up your cross every day and follow me. And you know where I'm going. And you know what's going to happen to me. But lastly, I think that what this does for us is it hopefully opens our eyes to a maybe a slightly different way of reading the Bible than we are used to doing. David mentioned really well, I think, and Phil mentioned the same thing on Monday night, that a lot of times we are so focused on the big and the flashy, the miracles, right, that we miss the fact that the miracles are not an end to themselves. They're, you're supposed to figure out what is behind them. You're supposed to connect them to the symbolism of what's going on in the Old Testament. You're supposed to say, what is this teaching about Jesus? In other words, you can't just look down at the bottom of your reference on your Bible and say, what passage is this? Okay, let's turn over to this uh, citation. We can read that. We can say, see, here's what's cited. We've done our due diligence. Fantastic. Let's move on. What we need to do is we need to live in Scripture and read in Scripture so that we hear these echoes. And we make these connections. Because that's where a lot of the communication of the Bible is done, between the lines. That is, you may not buy every single one of these connections and echoes that I've shown you here from Luke today, and that is fine. You probably thought more than you brought coming in. And what I encourage you to do is as you read your Bibles, both Old and New Testaments, is to keep your ears open to hear these allusions and these echoes and say, if this is what he's referencing, what is the point? Because those are the questions that got Jesus killed. Those are the questions and those are the points that, of course, the man, when he preaches his first sermon, very <coughs> Nazareth, attempt to throw him off the mountain for. Whereas I wonder if a me sitting in that audience would have been like, what's he talking about? Jesus should shock us. Jesus should not be comfortable for us. And if he is, I wonder sometimes if he's truly Jesus. So keep your eyes open for echoes. And think of that as you take your nap and have a great rest of the day. Thank you then for coming and talking to us today.